Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much. This is a great opportunity to have another conversation about something that is very close to our hearts, but also how can we move forward. So, um, so I'll, I'll go first, and then it's my great pleasure to turn it over to Liliana Garcia. So, uh, basically, I wanted to talk about the issue of discrimination in the interaction with drug use, access to services, and how is it that is impacting the immigrant population. So, it's a very, very quick snapshot of our experience, but then I'm going to uh, uh, address other issues in the Q&A section. So, um, I really like Amber when she said in uh, one of the most important uh, research journals that we have, what is that we don't address discrimination in prevention interventions? We do culture, we talk about cultural values, we talk about cultural conflicts, but we don't overtly address discrimination in those interventions. And you know, I present in a lot of NIH forums, and uh, it's really rare when you go to a presentation that talks about racism and discrimination, there may be cultural, acculturation gaps, but not discrimination per se. So that's, you know, I'm an immigrant, uh, and it took me 12 years to become a permanent resident in this crazy immigration system. And not just limited to this administration, but to previous, because we haven't done any, any substantive reforms. Um, so as an immigrant, you, you come pursuing a dream, and not to use resources or have the system, but pursuing a dream. But the reality that uh, many, many, many immigrants face, uh, particularly low income and those working in, um, uh, uh, you know, not in the industry or with undocumented status, is this: is like you come with dreams, you want to contribute, and then all of a sudden, this is the narrative that you express. And I think I connected with this since I came here in 1999. It, it was my first experience. Within a week of being here as an immigrant, I experienced the first blatant experience of discrimination. So now that we're having this conversation, some folks said, well, I didn't know. Well, it's like because many of us were not paying attention to many issues. Now we know a lot about many things of many expressions of discrimination because I think we're having the conversation now because things have become so blatant, but not because they did not exist. So this is very much the messages we, we get, and particularly the most vulnerable immigrant populations. And it's compounded with the tremendous legacy of the U.S. and slavery, so it's not only the immigration status, citizenship status, but also all the issues associated with colorism. Um, I showed this to talk with my uh, students about Nazi Germany, and they say, yeah, no, horrible period of time. Well, uh, folks, but this is not Nazi Germany, this is our U.S. Department of State employees in the 1940s, when they actively recruited thousands and thousands of Mexican citizens to come to the U.S. to save the U.S. from crumbling. Uh, so they would uh, recruit them for roads, for fields, because of World War II, uh, the basic needs of the country were collapsing. So I always go with these pictures because we have all this rhetoric about immigrants want to come and want to use resources and all that. Uh, but we don't see that from a systemic or a historical perspective. Is when you set in motion such a massive movement of migration, what do you expect now? When you, when you are telling people, please come, we'll fix the situation for you, for your family, then all of a sudden your needs change and you expect that. Uh, that movement would not happen. And I think that's a conversation that is very, very, very important to have. And when you hear the stories of the abuses that took place when these uh, Mexican citizens were screened for health, it's appalling, right? So, but it's not Nazi Germany, it's the United States Department of State actively promoting that migration process. And, and that's why it's so difficult for immigrants to make sense of what happens here because it's like, you started a movement years ago, you actively pursue us. Um, you like your houses, uh, those long, you like the appearance that they have. You love your vegetables, um, you love your good meat and produce and all that. We do all that, we do all that. We have trucks in the border. We get notifications, I grew up in Chihuahua, we would get notifications when there would be trucks on the border uh, waiting for migrant workers, and they, we would get notifications at what time border and um, patrol wouldn't be doing rounds. I saw that on that side of the of the Mexican border in the 90s when I did a lot of community-based work right during 
border. So it's really hard when immigrants come and say, why do they hate us so much? They need us so much, but the rhetoric is that one that we are don't belong here. And we were talking about the ivory tower challenge and all that, right? And, and that's where I think our program of research goes along. I feel very passionate about prevention research uh, and linking and making sure our wonderful universities don't become isolated in ivory towers. So I'm very much a prevention researcher on drug use and research with Latino immigrant populations. But why did I get there? I think because I was for many years family therapist. And I went to at least um, 50 trials of adolescents on drug use charges, and the cross-examination was brutal. Uh, the defendants was a public defendant without skills. They wouldn't ask the questions I needed to respond to so I could make a case for those adolescents. So when you are at a trial and an adolescent gets, a, um, you know, um, the, judge, the judge rules two years in prison for a relapse of cannabis use, you're like, uh, really, is this, is, this, is, this a, is this a differential treatment? Is this how we're going to go about this issue? So um, I think a lot of pain, I saw a lot of pain, and as a result of that is that I became a prevention researcher. If there's anything I can do to help our families and communities not walk that path. So uh, this is a study that whatever hair I had left, I lost. <laughs> because it was so complicated, it was a two-year, uh, four-year randomized clinical trial in which tested the impact of two culture adapted parenting interventions. One was a very good adapted parenting intervention but focused exclusively on parenting issues, and the other one overtly addressed issues of oppression, discrimination, racism, and cultural conflicts. And this is why it's so important that you, your data analyst person is not you, because I, at the time when we got the data, like, can I look at the data? Like, no, don't get into it. <laughs> and, and, and it was like, uh, what basically what you see here is the intervention, these are child outcomes. The intervention in which we overtly address issues of oppression, discrimination, and racism had the most uh, impact, had the most impact compared to the uh, uh, intervention in which we only focus on parenting and way um, significant improvement compared to our control group. So that was like, yes, okay. no care, but good results. And now in a, as a result of that, the National Eastern Drug Abuse uh, was very interested in us expanding our program of research. That study was with families with young children, and they say, um, you know, have you thought about considering a submission focusing on uh, Latino immigrant families with adolescents? So I'm just going to do snapshots of the main of, of the narratives, and then I'll turn it to the and we'll have more time to talk about this in the Q&A. But uh, this is the type of issues that we focus on in the intervention in addition to parenting and that interaction with drug use. When we ask in those parenting sessions, tell us about what it's like uh, to experience discrimination as an immigrant. And this father took about 10 minutes to say his phrase. Discrimination is a very drink that you need to swallow. You have to swallow it because you say, if I get rebellious or do not decay, they can throw me into jail or they can help me. So you just need to swallow it. It's like basically swallowing that oppression. It's not like I have options, I can fight back. You just have to swallow it. Uh, and we see the, the immigration status based on the narrative. Uh, we have sessions in which we um, address, uh, overtly address is how are you going to prepare your child to be discriminated against. It's not like, oh, uh, let's hope your child will not be discriminated No, no, it's very much about racial socialization. How is it that you're going to get ready your kid for the world that is out there? And this mother expressed, I need to keep learning about how to talk to my children about racism because in many occasions my children have suffered racism just because they have a accent, they have experienced uh, racism. The class and culture are a tool that can help us as parents to be grounded here in this culture. We need more time to talk about this. I like to learn more about my own Latino culture and second, how can I kid, raise my kid in the American culture. Uh, this is a very sad quote. Uh, my son was bullied by classmates at school because I'm an immigrant. I started to notice him feeling sad with this. I got to the point of him saying that he wanted to die. The school helped us with the bullying because he was suffering. It's very important to reach out to our children because if we don't, they won't talk about these issues. We suffer by being immigrants where our children suffer even more. When we talk about this, my son tells me, Mom, I know you came here to offer us a better future. 
And this is a dramatic reality because that makes a status family, US citizen child, and mother with undocumented status. And this is one of the many, many expressions we've seen in recent months. Uh, this basically tells us that when there's an acculturation gap, it's a very complex contrast, we can talk more about that, but when children express a preference for English language, US uh, traditions, and their parents were raised in a foreign country, and they express a preference for Latino values and Spanish, there's a gap. And if family members disagree about that gap, or if parents say, you should be speaking Spanish, then you have a conflictual acculturation gap. Well, this tells us that the odds ratio, the risk, um, for alcohol use when you have a significant gap is clearly elevated among immigrant youth. So it's not only about depression, it's not only adversity, it's not only the um, one, a huge component of that bias of psychosocial component, is when culture becomes problematic, but also becomes problematic because in the context in which we live. Uh, so um, one parent is talking about this acculturation gap conflict. It's very important for us to know that we are trying to impose things on our children even though many of them have never been where we were born. They have lived all their lives here and we want to educate them like we were raised. We need to become aware that we live into cultures, we need to find a way to keep both cultures and we raise our kids. So this session is about uh, the gap is not the problem, uh, the, your kid is not the problem, the gap is the problem. So we need to externalize that symptom and as a family, how are we going to attack that? So I uh, want to close by uh, uh, showing the tremendous resilience of our people. And um, in the midst of all this, I continue to be um, impressed by how strong our people are in that willingness to say, you're not going to deter me from offering something good. When we started the NIDA trial, I thought that was it. That was because we started the, the first parenting program started it. In the, the, the first day of this administration. And I could see the policies that were coming. It's the best study we've done with a 94 retention rate wow. post-treatment. And I'm like, how did that happen? Is the family, the families, and the amazing interventionists we have. And this is an expression of that resilience. After talking with my daughter about immigration, she told me, Mom, I'm going to be a social worker when I grow up. There are too many injustices against Latinos in this country. That is why I'm gonna, uh, going to be a social worker so I can help. A part of this quote is like, oh, I wish this adolescent didn't have to engage in that conversation. Just be an adolescent. But another part is, we are in a generation in a um, very important crossroads in history, and we need to navigate this in a way that they don't lose that. Uh, ability to experience and enjoy and be adolescents, but at the same time embrace that sense of resilience that current times are in So that's it for me, and I'll turn it to Well, I would have to say, Duren, that your presentation really, you know, elicits so many thoughts in what I'm thinking about when I go to work each day. Because while the focus is certainly on immigrants and we know the devastating impact and the level of discrimination that occurs, I think one of the things that's very difficult as an older Latina who grew up in this country is the presumption of immigrant status to all of us who are brown. So I've lived my entire life within that narrative about when I go out and speak professionally, then the question that is put to me afterwards from the audience is, well, and where are you from? And I say, well, I'm from Texas. And yeah. well, but before. <laughs> and I said, no, I've always been from Texas. And they go, well, but where are your people from? And I have to say, you know, my people are from Texas. We've always been here. You moved the border. You left us here. We've always been in Texas. And so when you live with that presumption, then you look at the people for whom it is a true reality, and you think, if this is what I experience on the day to day, that has just got to be overwhelming. I know. And you look at what went on around the Braceros and the fact that they were invited back a second time, and that when they were removed, and they were forcibly removed, they also removed American citizens. They removed Mexicanos from this country who got caught up in that whole piece, and it didn't matter that they could prove their citizenship. They were just packed on the trains and removed. And then the effort to try and come back into this country was something that went on for years for them. So we see that whole presumption in the standing population, and then we look at groups that are coming in, and it is exactly as you say, 
as with all immigrant groups, and it's certainly true here, they engage in the work that anyone who's been here a while, for a while or for generations doesn't want to engage in. And what I always think about is the work that I've done in Georgia, where there's a lot of chicken processing, and there's been a lot of what the have gone there to do the chicken processing. Big, major uprising in the community. These people are taking our jobs. You know, we, why aren't they open for everybody? And one of the chicken processing groups said, absolutely. We will open it up and add, add a level of minimum qualifications, which is that you have to be able to follow the directions, be movable thing. We will take people on. And so they had an open arrival for you know jobs. And in the morning, long queues of people who wanted to be considered. They were all you know enrolled in the job program. They went in by the 10 o'clock break. A percentage of them left. Yeah. By lunch, a huge percentage of them left. And by the end of the day, it was like, we're not coming back. If these people want this work, they can have it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because there's an absence of understanding of what that work really requires. That then there's the and rhetoric around, oh, yes, they're coming to steal our jobs because fear and fear of scarcity really whips up a political agenda, even if it has no basis in reality, is, is sort of the point of the realm. This is what the conversation is always focused yeah. on. And I think one of the pieces that's missing in the discussion around immigrants in Texas and elsewhere along the South is that an equal number of Mexicanos were lynched as African Americans during that whole period when lynching was you know, sort of the, the behavior of the day and a mechanism for holding people in check. Um, and that you have, even within this state, one of the law enforcement groups from within the state was one of the more radical anti-immigrant anti-Latino groups in holding those groups in check. And so when it comes at the hands of law enforcement, it's even worse because then it's completely with impunity. I mean, if it's within the community, there's always the desire to hide it or that potentially someone could be outed or whatever. But when it's law enforcement, then it is essentially legal. And so I think with those histories, it's also difficult for people like myself who come in here to feel like, yes, we have the capacity to change the culture, to change the narrative. Um, and, and so the, the work that we see now, the work that Ruben is doing and his colleagues, is so critical. And it's critical that you're doing it at this institution as a matter of actual fact. Because in the last less than 50 years, representation of Latinos on this campus was essentially non-existent. And they fought for many years in the courts to limit that participation, to say it was system-wide, as opposed to campus by campus. So this changes, but that history lingers and people remember. Yeah. And so for the university to step into that space and say, OK, not discounting it, but seeing that we have a role and that we can affect it and that we can do a good job about changing some of these you know, historical dynamics, I think is, is an important and a huge first step. And so that's what makes me so excited to be engaged in these conversations. Because when we have worked with immigrant populations and we've looked at substance use, there's really only been two uh, motivations around it. It's either been some of that self-medication to dampen the fear and the discrimination, the results of, of that stigma and the stress that comes. And we see it happening more with women than we ever used to or that you would have thought would be reasonable among Latinas just because of the perception of use of alcohol and then you know sort of the historical cultural piece from from generations of you know what was acceptable behavior and what was not but seeing that more and more among women that we work with and then when it's been given to workers uh, where cocaine has been given to workers so that they'll work longer harder faster without needing to rest without being hungry so that they can produce because the time when crops are pickable are so limited, yeah. you want to get it all done and then get everybody out of the fields. Yeah. Um, and so interestingly, as, as all of this big discussion has gone on about the opioid addiction problem in this country, we can see immigrants in many ways excluded, blessedly I guess, from that fear because one, they don't access health care. And entry into that addiction is generally in response to pain management. So they don't access health care. Their pain is not considered. They're not very often prescribed opioids for pain management if they even do access it. And so then, fortunately, they've not gotten into this cycle of trying to respond then to the effects of the opioids in their system. 
but but the, the legacy of discrimination even in that element is really interesting and so for us when we talk about primary prevention of all things and we've been doing a great deal of it in intimate partner violence it is to say that you know men want to be nurturing have the capacity to be nurturing um, do not want to be violent it is not a, you know, sort of a, a cultural imperative that they do so, that there are many elements that can be brought to bear, but more than anything else, it is the opportunity to engage in a dialogue with other men. Yeah. It is being given the skills with which to have that kind of a conversation among men, and then the skills to participate differently in their relationships, and vocabulary. Because you know, it is really, how do you summon the appropriate words to engage in a conversation with somebody about, about stress and issues, pressures that are brought to bear to this important relationship from outside of the relationship. If you can't even name those pressures, then how do you address them internally with someone who's so dear to you, particularly if what you are trying to do is spare your children, spare your partner, and have a greater understanding and capacity to move forward, because it's important to continue to be able to put one foot in front of the other. Certainly resilience is, is incredible, but it is that whole force from underneath yeah. of trying to buoy yourself yeah. without that support that I think results yeah. then in so much breaking down. Yeah. Um, I, I consider examples of you know my father and his generation of men and what they went through. And then interestingly enough, I think about my son, who you know when I go to bed at night and, and I think he's out in the world and he's wandering around, my greatest both comfort and embarrassment is that I feel like I can say to myself, well, at least he looks like an Anglo from a distance. Yeah. Because I am so fearful of that desire to protect without any ability to do so. And so I, I watch him, too, and know that the, the expectations around being a male, the expectations around being a millennial, the expectations about being a productive citizen in this country, um, the expectations that you believe are coming to you from your parents, regardless of what they say. I can only imagine on young people what that means. And then overlay to that all of the limitations that come from immigrant status because of what you confront. I can't imagine. I, I am really just, it, I find it remarkable that people can continue. So I do want to see us keep moving forward for efforts to intervene in all generations, because I, I also have a great fear, even for, you know, uh, um, mm -hmm. older uh, oh. grandparent sort of people, because they are even more isolated, oh, yeah. have fewer options, um, have fewer opportunities to get that outside support. And I think my fear is rather, not that I'm not afraid for younger generations, I absolutely am, but I'm very afraid for, for much older and aging populations well, and so it's the entire spectrum of individuals that I think we need to be worried about. So that's my position Fantastic. today.